With the ESS exam coming up in a few days, I just wanted to give you some final tips for this year's examination. Here you can see my copy of the Environmental Systems and Societies Guide, the ESS Guide. This copy looks quite old and very much used. The ESS Guide has been in use for examinations since 2010. And this May, and then in November, will be the last time that this format of the examination will be in existence. But I certainly hope that everyone has a copy of this ESS Guide for especially in environmental systems and societies. The teacher notes can be a very powerful way to review in the days that lead up to the exams. And it's imperative that you have a copy of your ESS Guide and you carefully read all of the assessment statements and the teacher notes. Two sections of specific interest in this ESS guide are the Environmental Value Systems Review Diagram based on the work of environmental sociologist Timothy Oriordan. It highlights for you the differences between the technocentric, the ecocentric and the anthropocentric and gives some important pointers on value systems like deep ecologists and cornucopians and environmental managers and all of the details are well summarized and laid out in that diagram. It's well worth your while to spend some time reviewing the EVS diagram. And then we have the pollution management model, another extremely useful diagram, for it shows you the three tiers in managing a pollution problem. From the first tier, which is to eliminate the problem altogether, to the second tier, which looks at reducing or managing the problem to some extent, and the final tier, which looks at remediating or cleaning up the pollution problem. Again, it's well worth your while to go into the guide and have a look at the pollution management model. Especially for this year's exam, I would like to focus on these three command terms. For while all of the command terms are important, especially in the last two years of the Environmental Systems and Societies exam, these command terms have continued to be of great importance in the exam, and it's extremely useful that students understand what is required when they're asked to make an evaluation, which looks at weighing up the strengths and the weaknesses. But very important to include and to be mindful of is the need to end up with a conclusion. Similarly, when asked to discuss, you should present a balanced review including arguments, factors and hypotheses. For example, you may be asked to discuss climate change in which case you would have to produce arguments for both sides, again ending with a conclusion. Also, if you're asked to justify the criteria for a good protected area, for instance, you would review that area and cite valid reasons to support your claim that it is a successful area, ending up again with a conclusion. This need to include a conclusion would certainly serve you well if you can remember it because in the mark scheme one mark would be set aside just for including a valid conclusion. Now especially for paper 2 section B you should not believe that the two marks allocated for the quality of expression go for an essay question that integrates A, B and C into one long confusing answer. What the examiner wants to see is that sections A B and C have been laid out very clearly so he can identify what belongs to A, what belongs to B, and what belongs to C. Even the use of bullet points in answering these questions is allowed, but you must have some kind of continuity or flow or use of continuous prose within sections A, B, and C. And of course, the use of examples would help you to score those extra two points for the quality of expression. And don't hesitate to skip spaces between section A, B, and C. And finally, I would like to focus now on this central aspect of environmental management. For in every environmental systems and societies exams, students are bound to have to make suggestions for fixing environmental problems. This is one of the central themes in the course. And the fixes in environmental management can be well conceptualized 
with this model. And these include the technical fix, an example of which would be a scrubber that's used to remove pollutants that, uh, that might be emitted from a coal-fired power plant, or the use of hydrochlorofluorocarbons as an alternative to chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, or the use of wind power as a way of managing carbon emissions. Another type of fix is the behavioral fix, which would include educational campaigns to make people aware of the consequences of their actions and what they can do to fix them. Usually, governmental organizations and non-governmental organizations can have a part to play in implementing the behavioral fix. Tax incentives or disincentives, as the case might be, can also fit into this category. Then we have the legal or administrative fix, which includes the use of laws or setting up things like high occupancy vehicle lanes, which, which are those lanes where if you have your car fully occupied, you get preferential use of roadways. And always with laws, it's important to remember that laws will only work if we have proper enforcement or if the penalties are strong enough to make people comply with these laws and not break them and be willing to pay the penalties. And finally, we have the structural fix, which refers to a change in the way that management happens in certain situations. Often in some places, management comes from the top down and there's a lot of bureaucracy between the top management and the grassroots. In situations like this, it can be months or years before the financial resources are released by governments to help environmental problems at the grassroots. The solution in situations like this is to allow for a management model that is built on the principle of subsidiarity or giving power to the grassroots level. The people who engage every day with the environmental problems, the ones who are invested in the problem and the ones who would be best able to bring about a meaningful and long-term solution to the problem. In other cases, there might be a dictatorship in charge of a country, and the country might be torn by war or genocide. But before I close this video, I would just like to say a special shout out to my five special students taking the ESS exam this week, Wangi, Thomas, Jennifer, Cynthia, and Hannah. Good luck to all of you. I know you're gonna do great. Rock on.